Plenty of seats in the middle up here, folks, if you're standing in the back and looking for something. <laughs> it's like Southwest Airlines, though. You're last in, you're, you're sitting somewhere in the center. So, All right. I think we're good. Good to start. All right. <laughs> Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, my name's Joe Slowick. Today we're gonna to talk about a subject near and dear to my heart as a threat intelligence analyst. We're gonna talk about threat activity attribution and how the way that most people are doing it is, in my opinion, wrong. So, contentious subject off the bat. Really, this is more ecumenical. I just have a different way, or my company has a different way of looking at things than others, but we're gonna go into some of the differences that surround that and why there are other ways of thinking about this process than what we're used to. So who am I? Uh, I am Joe Slowick. I am a threat intelligence analyst and adversary hunter, a much cooler title working for Dragos, which is down the road in Hanover. Uh, pr prior to that, I ran the incident response team at Los Alamos National Labs. In fact, I still live in Los Alamos and Dragos is very happy to let me work full time remote. So most of the time, this time of day, I'm in boxer shorts and just kind of sitting in my office doing my own thing. Uh, before that, I was an information warfare officer in the Navy. And way before that, I didn't have a CS background. I actually dropped out of graduate school in philosophy from the University of Chicago. So that Navy philosophy background means that I can curse very eloquently, but I'm going to try to not do that here. So what are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to talk about typical attribution because you can't rail against something unless you define what that thing is. So at least I'll present to you what I find to be typical attribution when it comes to threat intelligence work. We'll talk about what the purpose of attribution should be from the defender's perspective, go into a concept called activity groups, which will fuel a alternative definition for uh, attribution techniques, talk about behavior fo focused attribution, and then go into a couple of really cool examples that tie into some high profile activity that's gone on in the industrial control space, because that's what I do. My company is an industrial control system security company, but I think they'll resonate because uh, you'll recognize some of these things from recent headlines. So traditional attribution is very similar to this terrible report that was put out by another company uh, several years ago. So it typically focuses on who, who done it. Uh, look for some sort of identifying details within the data and tie these back to some concrete entity that we can point at and blame. Uh, in the case of this, there was a lot of really bad data involved. And uh, while it's probably no doubt that the Iranians were doing some net, uh, shenanigans at this point in time, what was put out in that report in the drive to push a narrative that, you know, hey, the Iranians are doing all this malicious cyber activity and they're going to turn off the lights and such resulted in some truly terrible conclusions. But enough bashing other people. Really what we're looking for is, you know, what's the benefits of this traditional way of looking at attribution? You know, quite frankly, it satisfies a very primal human need. You know, who done it? Who do I blame? Who's at fault? I want to point a finger at someone and call them out and make them stop. It frames matters in a way that's cognitively not easy, but you know, it makes sense to us. We like to look at things in narratives or stories. Like I want to tell a story that this action happened and it was uh, you know, the person who did it was this guy and it resulted in these sorts of things. Well, identifying who owns that action or who performed it is very fundamental to how we want to think about things. The problem is, you know, doing this sort of attribution is really hard. You know, typically our only collection, uh, especially unless you're in some spooky three letter agency down the road from here, you know, all you really got to work with are technical <laughs> artifacts that you might have gathered in, you know, an incident response scenario harvested from public or commercial data sets. You don't really have access to things like the emails the adversaries were sending back and forth within their own network. That would be very strange. So as a result, you really have to infer intentionality from what you can observe. And those technical artifacts do a really poor job outside of broad brushstrokes. You know, this is ransomware. This is an information stealer. You know, it's hard to get a feel for, you know, who's really behind this and why are they doing it? Uh, most importantly, I think, and this doesn't get mentioned as often as it should, is that a preoccupation with trying to come up with attribution based upon an identifiable entity really plays into the possibility of cognitive biases. So if you assume that like, oh, the Russians are doing it. I run a I'm having a problem thinking of an example off the top of my head now. Some organization that is immaterial in the grand scheme of things. The Russians are not coming after me. That may be true, may not be. Quite frankly, and I think this was a point that was made very well at the keynote today and something I like to emphasize personally, you don't get to choose who's your adversary. They choose you. So really identifying more along the lines of what actions are going to take place and how to respond to them is where you should be going. Furthermore, and this is the industry I think needs to wear a hair shirt on this, is that a lot of companies are really hot to trot for saying like, yes, we know North Korea is responsible for this. 
But the problem is, is that based upon that same data collection issue I mentioned earlier, yeah, we can maybe get just far enough based upon some malware similarity, some IP addresses, maybe language sets, although none of this is really definitive in and of itself to say that, yeah, it was probably country X. We take the media bump, but then we can't really go any further than that. And it's disingenuous to think that, you know, all entities operating under the umbrella of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea or the Russian Federation or the People's Republic of China or the United States are really the same team. There's different groups that are operating under this broader aegis. So they have different motivations, different techniques and different ways of operating. So as a result, we don't really get a meaningful look at what sort of distinction we're trying to make in this sort of ham-fisted attribution that doesn't seem terribly beneficial. So here's some media examples. So Metrolink targeted by the North Koreans, Russia behind NotPetya, uh, the cyber attack targets safety system at Saudi Aramco is especially fun for me since that related to the Trisis instant incident that uh, my company did a lot of research on. But you know, all of these are really trying to go for generating a certain amount of headlines and now, I don't want to call out the, this too negatively or whatever, because if you look at the general populace and, you know, what kind of uh, publications are we talking about here? Washington Post, Foreign Policy, Ars Technica, uh, The Star. I forget where I pulled that from. My apologies. But these are all mass media publications. These aren't technical journals. These aren't white papers. These aren't malware analysis reports. So, you know, there's a limitation to how deep we can dive here. But in presenting these things as being a black or white country A or country B, we're covering up a lot of nuance that's important to note in how these sorts of activities take place. So what do we gain knowing that country X is responsible for event Y? And I say this from the perspective of network defenders. So from a network defense perspective, you'll likely get nothing. Or for that same cognitive bias issue I talked about, it might be damaging. Like, oh, the Chinese just want to steal information. The Russians are, you know, really shifty and they can burrow in networks for years and we'll never catch them. And the North Koreans are destructive. Like, all of these are assumptions that can potentially damage how you approach an incident if you're bringing into it a preconception of how that incident will play out. Now, having said that, um, Again, this is purely from the network defender perspective. If you're a policymaker, maybe even a C-level institute member, it might make sense to know who was responsible. I would like to think that the president of the United States has some conception of who's to blame for an incident, therefore informing certain policy choices. Uh, but none of us in this room, although these days, who knows or whatever, could be, is going to be president anytime soon. Um, but... You know, really what we're looking to do is try and figure out a way to defend the networks that we're in responsible for and secure those um, networks from an adversary. So determining who is responsible, it's nice, but it doesn't have any real specific value for defense. But identifying how an attack took place allows us to inform defense and try and build a more effective means of responding to data based upon the threat profile that you develop for your organization. So what attribution should do is that as a result of getting an idea for what sort of entity is responsible, how they operate, is that you can align resources to meet that adversary, identify tactics, techniques, and procedures, and then focus your defense in a way that allows you to maximize what limited resources you have available to the threat landscape that you actually face. And ultimately, if it doesn't somehow assist you, inform your defense, make it easier for you to use the resources that you have, what's the point? It's a book report then. I read something that's entertaining, but it doesn't help me do my job. And so those sorts of things might be fun in our spare time, but I don't know about the rest of you. I only have so many hours, and I spend way too many of them as it is, working in information security. I want to make sure I'm getting the most value out of those. So what attribution should do is follow a general process, and I'm assuming we're in the greater Baltimore area. How many people have a DOD background in here? Hey, people are being honest. Okay. Um, you know, this will look a lot like the intelligence cycle. So really, you know, what attribution should try and do is that an attack take, takes place uh, either against your organization or against a third party. Try and collect and aggregate data, record the context around which it happened. Then from there, start turning that raw data into information. Uh, formulate conclusions based upon what actually happened within the environment, what actions took place, the, uh, progress of events from A to B to C, and then develop a conception of the adversary, not based on who you think they are, but rather how did they behave? How does the adversary act? What are their targets? What are their intentions from a technical perspective? Their infrastructure, what did they try and get to? Now, the results of this is that, one, you get intelligence. That's my field. 
uh, track how the adversary operates, learn to try and anticipate activity based upon not specific instantiations of a behavior, but rather generalizations of how that adversary behaves, which leads into the next step, and this was mentioned in an earlier talk on incident response, you know, having that idea then lets you begin to develop playbooks for how you're going to respond. When I know that this particular adversary has compromised my network, I have a reasonably high confidence that their follow-on actions, their follow-on toolkits look like these sorts of entities and allows me to prioritize my response to that adversary. And finally, from a remediation perspective, gives you an idea for what sort of things you need to go in and clean up, what sort of uh, persistence mechanisms may have been in place, what little toys and fun things might have been left behind after you clear away the most obvious pieces of the intrusion. So ultimately, we really want attribution to prepare and enable defenders. If it doesn't do that, I'm not interested. This allows us to improve defenses and potentially anticipate attacks as long as we have good data collection on how these adversaries are operating. Anything else is superfluous. You get flashy media headlines, provocative stories, could even cause some level of danger by you know, pointing fingers irresponsibly at other organizations and saying like, nope, these guys are responsible when no, those guys weren't responsible whatsoever. Uh, false flags come up a lot. And uh, the Olympic destroyer example with the Pyeongchang opening ceremonies was a case study in that where it's like, oh, South Korea got attacked. Must be North Korea. It's like, well, wait a minute. Might look like the Russians. It's like, wait a minute. Maybe they want us to think that it looks like they're... So you go down a rabbit hole really fast. Instead of just approaching that scenario as like, oh, here's a wormable infection vector that's using credential seeding and replay to spread throughout a network for destructive purposes. Full stop. Respond to that. Doesn't matter who the hell's responsible for it. You've got an idea for how to approach that problem now. Now, the way that we do this at Dragos and that I uh, approach this personally revolves around a concept called activity groups. It's a methodology for defining actors not based on who they are, but how they operate. So the who in many cases is fundamentally irrelevant. It could be anyone, but here's how they act and here's what they're up to. So the focus really is on observables. If it's not something that you see, not something that you can test, not something that you can play with, it's a theory, it's an intuition, or it's a really bad assumption. So you need to avoid speculation and inference, get away from, again, potential cognitive biases, and look for a definitive picture for how an attack took place based upon concrete data retrieved from either the incident or from outside sources and enrichment. So in looking at this, I like to call out an example, you know, going back to what I said earlier, you know, the U.S. computer network operations activity is not a monolithic entity. Neither is Russian Federation computer network operations. Instead, you know, you have a command authority, you know, Vladimir Putin's up here. After that, like, okay, you'll have some development teams. These are the guys who put together your malware, do some other stuff or whatever. They're your specialists for creating tools. And then off of that, you've got a bunch of different operations teams. You've got the GRU, the SVR, the FSB, or whoever that actually go out and execute. Not only that, but the SVR itself, or just like the U.S. military, is not a single monolithic organization either. They have Team A, Team B, Team C. All of those teams have different goals, different targets, different mission sets, and they probably have operational tells. So breaking this down on an activity group basis moves us away from a lot of what you see with attribution that really focuses on development teams. You know, what does the malware look like? Well, the malware might be shared by a bunch of different people that are doing different things and get us one further level down to where the rubber meets the road and we see these actors from a defensive standpoint who's actually trying to break into my network. Yeah. So traditionally, you know, we're focusing on readily observed items, C2 IP addresses and geolocation off of that, because that's really useful. Um, malware samples, which, you know, it's important. Your tools tell a lot about who you are, but tools can be reused, repurposed, um, stolen and used by other entities completely separate from their originators. So as a result, really going back to that previous slide, development teams get a lot of attention, but the actual operations components of computer network operations uh, don't get the attention they deserve when that's really fundamentally what we as defenders need to worry about. And I keep saying defenders, if there's red teamers in the room, it's okay. You don't have to acknowledge yourself. We'll make fun of you later. Uh, so breaking out operations is that, you know, different operations teams can use a similar tool set for different operations. And one of the examples we'll talk about in a little bit really goes right to this point. But a behavioral approach to identifying these entities makes sure that we could actually break these out and track them from a perspective that matters to how we're going to organize and implement our defense. The goal is to identify operations teams by their behaviors and to the best that we can determine their objectives. That could be by industry vertical, could be by, you know, distinction between data stealer versus um, malicious attack, disruptive attack, etc. 
Now, informing how we define an activity group is something that I am obligated to present as being an important document because the man who authored it is my boss, it is the diamond model of intrusion analysis. So this is something put forward by Sergio Caltagroni, my boss, and two other guys who I'm sure are important, uh, Andrew Pendergrass and Christopher Betts, <laughs> that, uh, no, it's a really good paper. I highly recommend everyone read it, but maybe not right before bedtime. But, you know, it really does approach this idea of how to go out and, uh, you know, this paper specifically focuses on how to uh, use this for intrusion analysis, but it can be extended in order to define uh, threat intelligence activity and the sort of attribution we're talking about right now. So it's called the diamond model. I wonder what it looks like. It looks like that. So really, it's a concept where you have, you know, at its center, here's your activity group. What defines what an activity group looks like? Well, each of these vertices, you have an adversary, yeah, an adversary, the who, it's just one part of the whole. And not only that, it's not even the most important part. But then the adversary implements infrastructure, the means by which they connect to a victim, and a capability, how they will then impact that victim environment, which lastly goes back to the victim or target. What are, is this infrastructure used to deliver what capability in what environment? And you take all of this as a whole, and that gives you a conception of like, oh, what does this look like? Who are these people? How do they operate? What are their... Uh, fundamental goals from an operational perspective. So analysis in this case primarily focuses on the technical observations that are available to us, but using them in a way to abstract from the particulars to come up with a general conception of behavior. So the main things we'll focus on are infrastructure and capabilities. Like I said earlier, the adversary can be abstracted. You can give them name, you, funny names, My Little Ponies, Pokemon, something. Uh, I'm wearing my Pokemon shirt today, by the way. My daughter loves this shirt, so if you're can't make it out, check it out later. Um, and then the victim might be useful for parsing out campaigns or trying to figure out what applies to your threat model. But, you know, it's really focusing on that middle uh, of the diamond and looking at those technical indicators to figure out what is it that you're looking at. So infrastructure, like I said before, is simply the means through which a capability is executed. It provides a link from the adversary to the victim, the means through which a capability will be deployed. And in looking at this, you can categorize infrastructure through both atomic and behavioral or um, brain fart, um, complex uh, identifiers. So atomic elements of infrastructure are your traditional IOCs. You have an IP address, a domain name, uh, maybe a few other sorts of things. It's very relevant to an identified event and critical from an incident response perspective. But from a moving forward perspective, it's absolutely useless. IP addresses change, domain addresses are a dime a dozen, especially now with all the stupid TLDs we have. So it's not necessarily um, helpful to characterize future activity based upon a single atomic infrastructure IOC. But if you abstract from this one layer higher, deeper, take your perspective, you could start picking up trends and patterns and well, what kind of infrastructure are they using? This is less likely to change because everyone has tendencies, laziness, a way of operating, especially when you start talking about large bureaucratic organized environments. It's like, well, this is how the SOP is written. This is how I'm going to register dirty domains. So you get an idea for how is it that this adversary is going to go about continuing to at least form the baseline of their operations. So examples could be things like SSL certificate creation and infrastructure types and themes. So examples of this that I like to call out a lot in my own reporting, you know, what kind of infrastructure do they use? Do they register their own devices? Do they buy their own virtual private servers? Or does your adversary go out and compromise some poor university and use a bunch of servers sitting over there as their hot points and their exfiltration points before getting back to their own network somewhere? Hosting and registration patterns are a good one. Uh, I was kind of upset to see that they put this out there. I believe it was Threat Connect had a pretty interesting article about uh, APT28 Fancy Bear domain and uh, registration activity, that has been the same for five years. Uh, maybe it won't be now since it's very public at this point. Um, but yeah, these guys just kept doing the same thing because it worked and no one was really catching on to it all that much. And then another one that's interesting is SSL certificate reuse. So, you know, are you reusing the same SSL certs? Maybe you're generating new certs, but maybe your SSL cert metadata looks very similar across each cert. APT28 provides another good example there with some of the cert metadata on a lot of their items for the course of about a year and a half. I, we can go in that as a sidebar. We don't have all that much time. So anyway, we've talked about infrastructure. What about capabilities? Works kind of the same way. It's what an adversary utilizes to achieve an objective against victim. You know, how do I get effects on target? Sorry, I used to be in the military. 
Uh, it's primarily behavioral in nature when properly implemented, but it can include indications of intent as a result. Going back to what does this software do? Does it overwrite the MBR and shut the computer down? That's a wiper. Does it, you know, search for all XLS and doc files? That's a data exfiltration tool. So it gives you an idea of intention there, but, you know, we don't want to read too much into that necessarily. And again, there's an atomic aspect to this. This is your traditional, like, hey, I have a hash value. I have a registry key, maybe. Um, some other sorts of things that you can poke out. Um, but just like the infrastructure items, they're easily changed. Hash values are trivially easily changed. Um, and even things like reg keys, mutex values, etc. Like it's a means to an end. It's not necessarily something that's going to persist beyond a single action, maybe a single campaign, unless someone's a really bad adversary. But trying to understand the capability by understanding the underlying behaviors it's trying to achieve is really important. This goes to how the adversary operates. What actions are they typically performing? What methodologies are they implementing? You know, the general, it's almost like the difference between pseudocode and your ultimate compiled code. The pseudocode likely, or at least your source code, is probably not going to change all that much. You can make some changes around the margin, but that's work. No one wants to do work. I'll make a couple of edits, recompile it, and boom, I just defeated antivirus. I used PE spin, I defeated antivirus. But the fundamentals behind it are going to remain rather the same. So the goal is to build a picture of the adversary's operations, what they're trying to achieve and how they're trying to operate, rather than going towards the individual identifier for a specific event. So examples of this would be intrusion techniques, or you have someone who's using custom malware, or uh, as we talked about this morning at the keynote, you know, living off the land. What sort of coding and deployment consistencies are in place? Do they always use the same language? Are they reusing the same functions and not changing up compilers often enough that you could actually pick out specific functions in bytecode? That was the case with APT3 with a very specific time stomping function for almost 10 years. They did not change that piece of code, did not change how they were compiling their malware. Awesome little signature. Uh, and what tendencies do they have per, for persistence? Yeah, they create a run key, but how do they go about doing it? Or what sort of things are they dropping on target to make sure that they can stay in that environment after they get identified or to be able to come back and revisit it later on? So putting it all together, I want to characterize an adversary activity. Identify those commonalities and general trends in order to build that diamond picture. Uh, you know, but basing this off of the observed behavior that we find as a result of intrusion events, either stuff that we witness ourselves or by doing some you know, hard work and digging into what data is available to us from external sources. And then designer detections and alerts around that. You don't want to detect against what someone might do. You kind of want to do, you know, it's good to try and stay ahead of the game, but you know, invest your resources in the things that you know that the adversaries that you face are likely to use against you. This goes into an entire different conversation, uh, threat profiling and identifying threat models, which is another hour on top of this, and no one wants to sit here for two hours, and they won't let me, so we won't get into that this time around, but happy to talk about that anytime if anyone's interested. Not likely. But, uh, so looking at this in practice, you know, really you want to leverage all that available evidence that you have at your disposal to build this. If you're not using all the data and, or looking for more at every iteration, you're doing it wrong. There's always more that we can find uh, to both capture how things change over time as well as to improve the fidelity of the, of the uh, picture that we have of what activity we're observing. And when it comes to differentiation, uh, it's a simple rule. Uh, any two unique vertices on the diamond model means new activity group. So unique capabilities, unique uh, target or victim, okay, that's a new at, uh, activity group. Unique capabilities and infrastructure, new activity group. It allows us to try and sort out matters and break things apart based upon how we'll actually respond and react to them as we observe them. And let's talk about some examples to illustrate this. And I'm doing really good on time. I'm probably also talking really damn fast. Um, <clears throat> So the first example we'll talk about is one that I like rage about a lot It'll, in a number of ways because it just kind of bugs me. So Alanite and Dimaloy, two Dragos specific terms in Dragonfly. These are all Russian associated. We don't do nation state attribution at my company, but others are saying this. So we'll just say it, maybe it's Russian. So multiple reporting on Russian infiltration of US energy and ICS related companies in the summer of 2017. This eventually, uh, multiple threads of reporting, technical reporting and media reporting, combined what we feel uh, and can prove based upon the per, uh, technique that I've just spent the last half an hour railing at you about, uh, really represent multiple different activities. Probably related, but different enough that it's important to differentiate them from a response and monitoring perspective. The resulting picture that we're provided as a result of the you know, the who focused attribution is something that's less than ideal from a defender's perspective. 
So going back, uh, Washington Post published a nice little article that uh, U.S. officials say Russian government hackers have penetrated energy and nuclear company business networks. I forget if it was WAPO or if it was the New York Times, but someone pointed out a very specific nuclear power plant in Kansas as being a victim, which was not nice. Uh, but anyway, so it's like, okay, we had this going on. The government name for this campaign was Palmetto Fusion. That's how we referred to this activity initially for quite some time. Uh, the reason we know that is because the DHS report on that, which was TLP, it wasn't red, I think it was amber, uh, but it quickly went TLP New York Times and this got, got its way into the media. Anyway, um, after that, we had Semantic came out with, you know, in many ways, a really good report on something that they called Dragonfly. Now, for those of you with some experience in the ICS security space, Dragonfly should ring a bell. Dragonfly was an actor that was really active in industrial control related intrusions from about 2012 to 2014 or 15. Uh, they had a really cool piece of malware called Havocs that was able to pull devices using the OPC protocol, do some other gnarly things. Well, Semantic presented some activity that looked a little bit like the Palmetto Fusion stuff, but was different in some other ways, and rolled it all into this Dragonfly 2.0. Dragonfly is back. There it is. And then, fast forward a few more weeks, and then US CERT kind of stepped in to save the day. Is there anyone from DHS here? <laughs> okay. I, I, Heart goes out to you guys, man. You guys are doing a good job, but not necessarily always with the, like, everything that you need in order to do it. So TA17239 Alpha came out, uh, October timeframe, that took all of this activity and combined it into this is what's going on. Got rised earlier this year, a couple weeks ago, uh, pretty much the same as the last report, except this one said all of this stuff still holds, and it was the Russians. So we, maybe we gained something there, but I would venture that, like, not really. It hasn't, none of the underlying fundamentals here are any different. People still shouldn't be poking around in power networks. I don't care who the hell they are. So going to an activity recap, what does this look like? So in July, we had the Alanite activity. October, we had the report on Dymaloy, semantics continuation of Dragonfly, followed quickly by US CERT and then moving into the revised US CERT, meeting that very critical who's done it um, criteria. But there's a lot of distinctions here. So among other things, just from a simple time perspective, you know, the original Dragonfly was, you know, early 2010s, somewhat early 2010s, 2013, 2014, that time frame. Then you had this dimaloy like activity from late 2015 to early 2017. And then the Alanite or Palmetto Fusion activity doesn't really appear until the end of May of 2017. And a lot of it looks like it's kind of continuing. The time differences in question also align with substantial changes in tactics, techniques, and procedures. So for Dymaloy, uh, these guys, they're probably guys, uh, their initial access, phishing strategic website compromise. This will look familiar in a subsequent slide, but I'll explain how that's different. They deploy some implants. Dymaloy liked using, reusing commodity malware for all of their uh, operations. So they used a couple of remote access tools or Trojans. I mean, if it's not pretending to be something else, is it really a Trojan? Anyway, it's a rat. Uh, Karagani B, Heraplor, a couple other things, kind of associated with a lot of crimeware stuff. There's nothing really unique about it, but not using a custom platform. And then doing something similar for backdoors, using uh, Doorshell and Goodor for uh, a backdoor to maintain access to compromised devices. Once they were in places that they wanted to go to, they deployed a couple of different techniques. So they were doing credential capture uh, through a customized program that incorporated the Mimikatz source code and then added a couple of other things on there to do things like harvest SSH keys, harvest certificates, etc. And from a data collection standpoint, they had some scripts set up in order to harvest documents and gather other intelligence info of interest. It's like, okay, that's, that's how this looks. We just talked about capability right here. What's it look like? Well, there's a phishing message, which is ironic if you know what ISO 27K is. It's an information security standard. Underneath the covers is this monstrosity right here. So this goes back to a technique of um, prompting an external SMB connection using the file colon whack whack nomenclature, pointing to an adversary controlled IP. And in the case of Dymaloy, they put this base64 encoded looking thing here for a PNG. Like, huh, okay, that's kind of interesting. What this will do is that that outbound SMB connection, along with the attempt to like, hey, I want to talk SMB because your network is not poorly secured and you're letting me talk out on 445, is you'll get a Windows authentication attempt that ships with that, which could be broken in order to harvest credentials to get into the network. 
So that's the whole idea for that initial access. It wasn't trying to deliver a fish in the traditional sense of like, I'm going to drop a malicious document that's going to exploit you. It's just trying to get this to come out there in order to harvest credentials and RDP right back into your network. Alanite is similar but different. All generalizations are stupid. So you'll look that from an initial access standpoint, phishing and strategic website compromise. Huh, that looks familiar. We'll get back to that. But then moving on from that, there's next stage operations, all system scripts, publicly available tools, PowerShell scripts, and things of that nature. There's no real malware whatsoever with the exception of some use of Mimikatz-like tools. Uh, all of this was for credential capture and reuse throughout the network. Uh, plus from a backdoor perspective, like in, you know, they were, this entity relies on being able to capture and replay credentials to move around. To ensure that they were continuously capturing credentials in the target environment, they used a really gnarly technique of, uh, creating a link file, LNK file, with a, uh, icon image that used the same reference to an external object with the file command. So you load up, start, uh, menu or whatever, and boom, there's the icon. It tries to call back, call back out over 445, so you get another replay of the credential harvesting attempt. That's kind of cool. But anyway, like completely relying on being able to pivot through legitimate system means throughout the network. From an information collection perspective, uh, just seeing lots of publicly available password cracking uh, examples, Mimikatz, uh, some Mimikatz variants, um, I forget the network capture tool, but just things you could download off of GitHub, no customization whatsoever, and using RDP to move around and transfer files. Their phishing is a little different, uh, especially because the activity itself going to the targeting victim aspect was laser-like focused on uh, energy utilities. So what they were doing was sending out fake resumes, uh, some really good fake resumes with the exception that they sent CVs to targets in the US and resumes to targets in the UK. Now, uh, if you know the difference, that is not how that usually works. But other than that, they were doing a really good job like, hey, this guy actually looks like he knows his crap and uh, would probably make a good controls engineer hire. Under the covers, you see something similar, except where it's hosted within the, you know, we're talking compound document formats here, is you had it within the uh, settings XML branch, uh, and instead of seeing the base64 flagged or fingerprinted IDs, you're just getting this normal dot dot m. So looking at a template file. So again, there's a lot of similarities here. I'm buying that, but the way that it, we're talking about implementation also looks a little bit different. So I'm not going to stand up here and say that these groups are completely unrelated and these might be the North Koreans, but we're seeing a different instantiation of the activity in question. But then moving away from some of these operational uh, bits, there's some really significant targeting differences. So Daimeloid got its start in Turkey, uh, specifically with an energy company based in Ankara, before moving on to a lot of European targets and then some US entities got hit in the bargain. Broad-based ICS targeting, advanced manufacturing, oil and gas, electric utilities, etc. Alanite, however, only focused on the US and the UK, maybe Ireland. That's an open question because one of the phishing messages was just a plain text article or copy paste article about a energy substation construction project that was having pollution impacts on a tiny river in Ireland. It's very specific. I don't know why they would care about Ireland, but you know, so be it. But the main thing is that all of these were focused on the energy sector. So looking at this within the components of the diamond model, you know, we're seeing significant differences in terms of both the capabilities that were executed. Yeah, the, the same SMB thing is being leveraged, but being leveraged in different ways. So it could be an evolution of an existing adversary, or it could be someone, you know, saw the, I believe Cisco Talos published the first public article that I know about this technique. Like, oh, that looks pretty cool. We'll do the same thing. And then on top of that, you have, well, how are they impacting host environments? How are they getting in and staying in? You know, you've got one group that's using a lot of off-the-shelf malware, the other group that's doing complete script use and living off the land techniques. And finally, in terms of what they're going after, you've got one that's solely focused on US, UK electric utility environments, the other being much more broad-based ICS-related targeting. So at that point, like, you know, th th this looks significantly different enough to me that at the very least, we have a couple different operations teams here. So. Again, my opinion, they look substantially different from each other. Maybe I haven't convinced you. We can fight it out later in the parking lot. Uh, you know, the main thing is they may be related. One may be an evolution of one another, but based on the available evidence, they're not the same. And making them look the same or saying that they're the same really makes it a little difficult for us to defend against it because the implications are we've got different targeting and different techniques, which mean different responses. Like, yeah, it's important to really you know, bone up on your ability to detect and defend against living off the land techniques since everyone's doing it now, it's the new hotness, but 
you know, from a perspective of, well, who's doing it to me, to my industry, to other organizations like me? Again, we don't have infinite security budgets. You gotta focus on the things that are most relevant to you in the here and now and try and take care of other things as they come along. So if I'm prioritizing and I'm an electric utility, I'm much more worried about Alanite than I am about Dymaloy necessarily. And that shift in targeting uh, indicates potential like, change in priorities for these groups. Combining the two as one really just makes planning a little muddy and inhibits the ideal way of allocating scarce resources in the security environment. So, Dragonfly, Dymaloy, and Al Alanite may all be the same adversary, but different teams. Might all be Russia. That's very possible. I'm not going to say that's wrong. But they look different from each other such that, you know, at the very least, different TTPs and targeting over time make these look like different operations teams that might be all answering to the same taskmaster at the end of the day. And based on that, we can come up with different ways of designing playbooks, response procedures, and methods of tracking the, these entities that both have different levels of relevance for different organizations and different plans and procedures in order to go after, respond, and remediate after an intrusion. Now, something a little different. Covalite. Another internal Dragos term, and Lazarus. So Covalite was a group that we initially discovered through some kind of scary and very focused phishing in September of 2017 that was very targeted in some very specific U.S. electric companies uh, in a time when U.S.-North Korean relations weren't all fuzzy and warm like they are right now. We'll get back to the North Korean thing. Well, we don't have to. I said Lazarus group. So a review of how that phishing worked, what payload was dropped, and how the document was put together indicated a really strong overlap with the Lazarus Group. Who's the Lazarus Group? One more slide, sorry. So here was pu publicity. So NBC News, North Korea targeted U.S. electric power companies. Like, oh, that's kind of scary. That got reported in uh, early October. The activity itself was middle of September. Lazarus Group. So what do these guys look like? So the Lazarus Group is increasingly a catch-all for North Korean linked activity. DHS, U.S. government, publicly refers to this as Hidden Cobra. There's a couple of other terms that are out there as well, but Hidden Cobra is kind of the all-encompassing adversary term. Uh, I don't like the whole, like, the Lazarus group because it doesn't look like there's a Lazarus group anymore. It looks like there's this catch-all for all things that look like they're North Korean, and there's a bunch of different operations that happen to reuse a lot of the same techniques. Because if you look at Lazarus, you've got operations that range from, hey, I'm going to steal all your Bitcoins, to, hey, I'm going to steal your data, to, hey, I'm going to wipe your network and say that I'm part of, I can't even remember the Sony hack, goofy organization that they flagged. Uh, but the important thing is that something like Lazarus has been active since 2012, and possibly even earlier than that, doing all sorts of dirty things all over the world. Now, the link between Covalite and Lazarus is there's multiple technical overlaps. The malicious document dropper was a big giveaway because it was a very specific uh, decoding algorithm that was applied to embedded data within the document file to drop a binary on target. Uh, and then on the malware that was dropped itself, there was overlapping, overlaps in terms of the code and functionality, as well as obfuscation techniques and any analysis techniques that were deployed. Additionally, there was a little bit of infrastructure overlap, and I think this is where this group messed up. So typically, Lazarus in general, and Covalite specifically, they use compromised legitimate infrastructure, a university in Mexico, a nonprofit in Western Europe, something along those lines. And typically, you see um, specific infrastructure per campaign. These guys messed up, though, because for the Covalite uh, variant, while Covalite differentiated itself from the majority of other Lazarus observables in that it did a uh, if-else call-out to three different um, addresses upon infection, one of those addresses overlapped with a separate Lazarus campaign that was centered around Bitcoin theft. Like, huh, you guys messed up. You forgot that one. My opinion. Um, so yeah, reuse across campaigns kind of shoots some of that OPSEC right in the foot. Now, Covalite itself, you know, phishing with malicious document attachment, not a very good document on its face. We'll see an example in a second, but under the covers, it's pretty complex. The embedded executable is built via a macro, and then the exact executable beacons via a fake TLS connection to the compromised C2 uh, servers before reaching back to truly adversary-owned infrastructure. So the document itself is sent as a fundraiser invitation theme. You know, it looks like garbage. Like, okay, what's that mean? And then when you enable macros, you get this garbage. Like, I don't know about you, but if I did that, I would be calling my security. I would be my security team. But you should call your security team if you saw that. But beneath that. Uh, you know, what's going on? Well, here's what the macro looks like. So you've got a couple of different decoding routines that do a bunch of shifting back and forth and uh, picking from a bunch of arrays of strings. And it's really decoding and building a binary from all that mess right there. 
And we're not doing an hour analysis talking. Not only that, Jimmy's here. He'll yell at me. He's my colleague. He's a RE wizard. So he would yell at me because I'm getting something wrong. So we'll get to that later. But uh, Covalite and Lazarus, there's an overlap in capabilities. So that same phishing document, you can track back going almost a year and a half, different campaigns associated with different fragments of overall Lazarus activity, you know, stealing Bitcoin from Polish banks, phishing a technology, uh, IBM actually, so it's publicly available, whatever, uh, in the Philippines, going after uh, a... Um, theater high altitude missile defense um, contractor in South Korea, including this phishing campaign targeting U.S. electric companies. Um, some of the aspects are unique to Covalite. So the multiple beacon IP thing, that's only seen in the Covalite sample, as far as I can tell. I haven't seen another Lazarus example that does the try this guy, try that guy, then try this guy, then wait, then try this guy, that guy, and that guy. All the other Lazarus ones, like, try this IP. Try it again. And there's differences in terms of sleep times and some other things. Um, you know, but otherwise there's a lot of technical similarities between these things, which makes it pretty solid that either someone is deliberately going out and making this look really close to Lazarus to a degree that would require almost source code access, or this is part of the same overarching group. But there's a problem here. Lazarus simply encompasses too much stuff. We've abused this term to the point where it's no longer all that meaningful to us. That makes tracking, identifying, and defending difficult because... How many of us have Bitcoin wallets that we host in our organizations? I hope I don't see any hands. Okay. Uh, yeah, all right, we got one. All right, it's going to be a fun party tonight. <coughs> but, you know, some of us might have defense-sensitive data or other things which tap into some of these techniques, but not all of them. So really what we want to do is try and break these operations that are all being accumulated under a single catch-all group to try and find some differentiation so we can focus attention and resources. So the defender problem is to make sure that we have coverage for those things that are actionable and relevant to us. You know, he who defends everything defends nothing. So saith Frederick the Great, uh, even though he was kind of a jerk. But um, he said something smart on top of invading Saxony. But the main thing is that we don't want to waste resources on unlikely items because if we try and hold back all the things, we're going to let something through. So instead of trying to defend against everything, focus on the things that are most relevant to us, most likely to hit your environment. And then, you know, again, assume breach. Sorry, have a good IR plan for the things that you're not anticipating. Uh, the Lazarus approach by trying to defend against Lazarus is way too broad. There's too many things going on, too many variants of the malware. There's been a couple of shifts in TTPs over the cast, past couple of months, actually, because these guys are still active, um, that really prioritization is a critical thing in order to make sure that you, you know, keep touch with how this group is operating and evolving. So try and narrow your focus based on the activity in question. Covalite is very specific in targeting. If you're an electric utility, you need to worry about Covalite. If you're a Bitcoin wallet holder, you probably don't need to worry about Covalite. Maybe some Covalite-like uh, behaviors, but it's a different entirety when look, looked at as an activity than a lot of the other Lazarus activity. So the overlap in TTPs can be distinguished by the uniqueness in targeting and some of the uniqueness applied to the otherwise generalized set of malware. So filter the TTPs, uh, filter out those things that relate only to the non-ICS related things if you're an electric utility and avoid all the other Lazarus stuff because you're just going to be generating noise. So going back to our diamond model, and we have some infrastructure uniqueness. Uh, there was the one oopsie where they reused an IP, uh, but the victim target stuff really stands out. Capability is roughly the same, although there's some uh, differences there as well. But these are our main differentiators against something that might be overall looked at as Lazarus writ all. So where are we right now? Well, we're about 15 minutes before I'm supposed to get off stage. But where are we in the presentation? Start summing things up. Ultimately, what we want to do is we want to make defense manageable. We want to break activities up into component parts that we can deal with. Again, not defend against everything. Defend against the things that are relevant to your or environment, your organization. Use your resources smartly against what is going to be, you know, what fits your risk profile. Track what matters. And then focus your um, defense on that environment. So again, I mentioned earlier... One of the key components to this and applying this usefully in your environments is really coming up with a good understanding of what does my environment look like? Who am I? What do I do? What are my sources of business value? What are my sources of visibility? What are my, what are my areas of invisibility? What are my strengths and weaknesses? Building that into a picture of what your capabilities are, what you're presenting of value to a malicious actor, and then figuring out like, okay, now what do I do? You know, I don't necessarily have to worry about, you know, these things over here, but maybe if I'm a clear defense contractor, I really need to worry about foreign governments breaking in and stealing plans to the F-35. There might be some that haven't been stolen yet. I don't know. But if there are, those are still out there. Um, 
So really, you know, shaping what it is that prevent that presents itself as a threat to you and how that's going to act so that you know how to orient your environment. To start taking strategic decisions. Uh, again, the keynote this morning was very excellent on this front because you know this goes into the aspect where as defenders, ultimately we kind of own our environment. Maybe not as much as we like because there's a IT and IT security divide, but we can take actions to shape, manage, and otherwise contort that our IT environment to fit our defensive needs, setting up strategic network choke points for monitoring or blocking purposes, establishing baselines in terms of system uh, health, system application and whatnot in order to meet the challenges that we face with particular adversaries, trying to devise ways that for the threats that we face that we can you know, lay as many, I thought it was really excellent, bear traps and alligators and dinosaurs and other stuff to make it just a royal pain for the adversary to break in. That's something that we can control and having an idea for what it is that we need to protect and how we need to go about doing that enables this sort of activity. So ultimately, you know, going to the Lazarus example and, and something we talked about very early is differentiating between actors, campaigns, and TTPs. So when looking at entities, you know, don't just think that you have monolithic groups that correspond to some magical nation state in the sky that are coming after you. No, you have different bureaucratic organizations, different units of whatever is people, liberation, cyber army, national force or whatever that are all competing against each other to hit their metrics for the month that all have slightly different targeting profiles and different ways of operating. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that everyone's going to operate alike, but rather break this out into how each individual group that you can observe operates within the scope of what you need to respond to as a defender from the profile of your organization. Also note that, you know, campaigns shift over time as well. You know, one of the things that I think is confusing with the Daimloy, Alanite, and going all the way back to Dragonfly example is there is a lot of similarity here. You could look at these as being campaigns that have been executed by probably the same command authority over time against very similar targets, but they've shifted over time. So is that because you've had a evolution in tactics over time, farming this out to different operational groups because the first one was out of rotation or didn't do a good enough job? But understanding that these things aren't going to be static and shaping to the TTPs that are observed within the environment is critical to, you know, keep up with this problem. You know, there's the myth of the that myth, the legend of the Red Queen that, you know, she keeps running and we keep getting halfway there. Well, that's insufficient because we're never going to catch her. So you need to figure out a way to beat the damn Red Queen. Just beat her over the head with something uh, and overtake her. And in this case, by trying to come up with an idea of anticipating behavior within the network environment, how attack's going to look so you can shape your defense to match what your adversary is most likely to do. So let's try and draw this to a close. Attribution's really good when it's properly focused, and it's pretty damn useless when it's not. Uh, identifying activities provide... Oops. There we go. There we go. Uh, identifying activities provides an actionable information to defenders. You want to look for things that are going to assist, you know, if your management going to help your people do their job. If you're one of those people, something that's going to assist me in making my network safer or in facilitating my ability to respond and remediate in my environment. Doing that means you focus on observables. You know, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me, don't just try and read things in because of who you think is responsible. Base your conceptions of what this activity looks like off of the evidence that you have at hand and what you're able to collect through other sources. You know, it doesn't just mean that everything that hits me forms my data set. No, you have to go out and do research. Go pull public reports, go to public data sets, try and build a broader profile, not just what was used against you, to really get a grasp for how the activity works. And maybe there's different groups that all align to a similar set of capabilities, but are applying them in different ways, such as we saw with the broad scope of Lazarus activity. So really what we're trying to go after, because we all like things that are, you know, graphically focused and go A to B to C, is a process. Is that we want to have an activity that we can narrow down and define. Note observable items, determine their operational purpose, and then align those observations, because there's no, going to be no one size fits all to a lot of this activity. If you don't work to relate this specifically to your environment and needs, you're doing something wrong. So you want to make sure that you align those observations and coming up with defensive planning to your needs and your network. So characterize the activities you observe then. Group them into, you know, holes that make sense, you know, entities that make sense, and orient to the targets and perceived interests for your organization and for your perceived adversary. And then based upon all that, you can then define a group around the characteristics you've observed. You can focus on that observable behavior and build your detection and defenses around that. And now you've arrived at, in my opinion, a much more robust way of identifying, tracking, and defending against malicious activity. So 
that's all I've got, and I've got a lot of time left, so. <laughs> Questions, comments, rotten fruit? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Potentially, uh, so the question for those who couldn't hear, like sometimes it's important to have this attribution by country perspective because if you don't tell someone that, hey, the Russians are in your network, they're going to blow it off. Like, I don't care, we have intrusions all the time. Uh, I would say that might, might very well be true, but I would say that perspective is terrible. Um, so the, the way that I would look at it is if you're defending a network, you know, first off, going back to the silly Prussian king example earlier is you're never going to defend everything all the time. So you have to accept and anticipate you're going to get compromised. You, you can't just defeat everything on the front door, but you really should be approaching this from a, hey, if someone, you know, you staying within my realm, breaks into my uh, process control network for an electric utility, I don't care who the hell it is. That bothers me. It could be the Russians. It could be the Botswanans. It could be whoever. I need to start reacting. So I think it's intellectual laziness on the part of defenders, uh, information security, to make the assumption that it's like, oh, it's crimeware or whatever. Who cares? Well, like there hasn't been the case of certain actors behind large crime work campaigns who also, you know, moonlight doing things like shooting Zeus out there and their day job happens to be working in an office building in St. Petersburg with people with guns in it and whatnot. Um, you know, so really it's, it goes back to that idea of a cognitive bias that we're setting up that just because of who's involved that I either should care, shouldn't care, or here's how they'll operate. Um, I think that some people might use that as a way of triaging. Then it's like, oh, it's just some script kitties in Eastern Europe or whatever. I don't care. They can mine some Bitcoins and I'll kick them out. Uh, but that's the wrong way of approaching it because that goes back to the who I'm assuming is in my network versus how they're acting, which is the whole point to this or whatever is like, instead of going for who you think it is, go for how they're acting and base your response off of that. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, for nations, uh, from a, like assigned to nation states. So the value, in my opinion, uh, it's here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, so from the, this is why. So really the way that I'm looking at this is, you know, Daimolo is a placeholder. It's really just a, a signifier for something else. Could be anything. Could be Martians for all I care, but it's a collection of observables that I get an idea for, okay, when I see Daimolo, I know that I'm going to, you know, probably see, unless they've changed and thus have shifted into something completely new, a uh, commodity like malware, the use of phishing for credential capture, RDP for initial access, with an ultimate goal for data capture and further pivoting within the network. It gives me an idea for how does this intrusion activity look like in order to do things like, you know, the playbook example, like, all right, if I see this collection of activities or some of these, like, these are the follow-on questions that I should be asking as a way to focus my investigation and my response. It also lets me, from a targeting perspective and going to that intelligence aspect, like, all right, I know that this thing I'll call Daimloy uh, happens to be really interested in these indu industrial verticals. Shit, I'm part of this industrial vertical. I better make sure that I'm paying attention to how these guys operate, even if I don't want to maybe prioritize resources on browser-based cryptocurrency mining. So, right, does that help? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. I've given you five minutes back. Thank you, everyone.